Well, the journey started about eight and a half years ago in my basement. And my basement was not this large. It was about 30 people. And uh, look at this. This is um, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. We're going to be working out of the text of 1 John chapter 1. If you have a Bible, um, you can look there. We're going to put the, the verses on the screen as well uh, to help us all out. We really are, are glad that you're here, specifically those of you who came with friends, who came with family, who are not used to doing church. This is not the way we do every church service. I just want to go ahead and say that. Um, we, we kind of blew it up, and we are trying to, to uh, be appropriate for this day, which is a day of celebration. So we hope you feel welcome and comfortable. We have four great campuses all over the city, um, smaller places where you can connect and meet people and explore the claims of Christ. So uh, I, I commend that to you and Connection Point and, and the people who brought you will be able to help you that way. Uh, sometimes it's really easy to uh, do religious stuff without really engaging your heart. Um, uh, we, we've made that difficult for you, I hope, uh, today, but it's really easy to do. I found myself praying with my family uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I, I'm a pastor, so I talk too much and I pray too long. And so I was doing that in the prayer before the family meal uh, for dinner. Uh, I was kind of going on and on and on. It was kind of like that, that moment in Meet the Parents, right, when, um, when uh, the, the, you know, Ben Stiller was praying. It was a little bit like that. I got bored with my own prayer. So I, so I opened my eyes, and all of my children were, like, looking around. And, and, and I thought, well, you know, they're little kids. And I looked at my wife, and she was kind of looking around. And so... Well, my point is this, it's very easy to kind of just go through the motions and disengage, um, and, and especially now during sermon time, because um, it, it, it is easy to kind of read the Bible and think, oh, that was a great stuff a long time ago. But the guy who wrote our text, the human author, was a real guy. He, he was a live dude, okay? And, and what I love about John, John the Apostle, is that he wasn't a nice guy. He ran to conflict, not away from it. He was a fight guy, not a flight guy. I can totally identify with him. One time he was walking with Jesus as one of the disciples, and these group of people would not let them walk through their land. And, G and, and John had this great idea. He said, Jesus, how about we call down fire from heaven and fry these people up like a crispy piece of bacon? Don't you think that's the heart of the Father, Jesus? Well, isn't that a good idea? And I can, just, I can just imagine Jesus' face at this point. Like, really? That's your best idea right now? That's the essence of, of Christianity. Thanks, John. John was this violent guy who God really arrested with his wonderful grace. He was a truth guy who became a grace guy. He was a fighter who became a lover. He was a son of thunder. That was the nickname Jesus gave to him, who became a son of love. Now, what happened to John is that he encountered the living God. Now, now this is tough for people in our culture, and maybe for some of you that are here, because it's pretty cool to talk about Jesus as uh, a, a good prophet, a fine you know, a teacher, um, a, a good moral leader. Jesus can even be our homeboy, right? We have t-shirts, and so it, it's okay to talk about Jesus like that. But when you claim that your life has been and is being changed by a homeless Galilean, Galilean peasant who lived 2,000 years ago, people raise an eyebrow in our culture. It's a little strange. People are cool if you participate in cultural Christianity, right? If you quote verses from the Bible at appropriate times or, or that you commend and exhort for a just and moral society, that's, that's good. But when you start saying, uh, I follow a dead guy who came alive, uh, the, the blood pressure of your friends and family go up a little bit, right? Because what that does, when you claim resurrection... When you say that actually happened, Jesus didn't just rise again in the hearts of his disciples. No, he was dead, 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 really dead, and got up from that tomb. When you say that, that messes with people. You know why? Because every single human being has a view of God. And you mess with that when you say Jesus rose from death. You mess with that in them. I have a friend 
and he really is a friend. I really love the guy. He's probably the most prominent atheist in our city. He has a very well-trafficked blog, um, very smart guy, and, 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 and he, 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 he is just very interesting. But here's the deal. Uh, uh, atheism's making a comeback, They're, and, and, but, they, but they never get above like 10% of the, the poll. All, every poll that's ever taken, 90% of human beings believe in a God. Now, we disagree as human beings on what kind of God we believe in. Some of us believe in a God who is real but impersonal, kind of like the Star Wars God, right? He's the force. He does karma, but he's not really personal. Others of us believe in a God who is unknowable. He's real, but we can't really know him. He's like a, 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 a musician or a rock star or an athlete. We see them, we see what they do, we hear what they say, but we're not going to know them. Some of us believe in a God who is real, but he's distant. I mean, we know him, but we don't know him. It's kind of like many of our dads, right? We know dad, but do we really know dad? A lot of us look at God that way. And when you talk about resurrection, here's what you do. You upset those worldviews because if resurrection is true, God is both actual and personal. He is both real and knowable. And this is what John is talking to us about. Now, what I love about John is he wrote several books in the New Testament. Uh, he was the human author. The Holy Spirit was, was the, the divine author. And he wrote the book of Revelation, that spooky book at the end of the Bible that everybody makes movies about, right? And everybody speculates on. And boy, if I was really into time charts and all that stuff, I could have fun with the screen. Let me tell you something. But we're not going to go there because, because John is writing to people of a certain persuasion. And you catch it if you're reading him. He, he wrote one of the Gospels, the account of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus, along with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John differentiated his gospel, though, and contextualized, fitted it in for a certain group of people. Matthew wrote for Jews. Mark wrote for Romans. Luke wrote for Gentiles. John wrote for Greeks. And so if you're reading John, and if you've ever read Plato or Aristotle, you, you kind of see some similarities, because what he does is he uses Greek philosophy to help us understand who Jesus is. And one of the words, and it's actually in our, in our text, is this word, word. It's the Greek word, logos. And the logos was the soul of the world. The, the force that originated and permeated and directed all things. It was the supreme governing principle of the universe. And what John is saying in our text is, Jesus was that. Jesus, John is saying, was God. Now, this messed with me as I was exploring the claims of Christ as many of you are. I mean, I can understand teacher, I can understand prophet, I could even understand Jesus was God's son, though I had zero church background, it made sense to me. But, but Jesus is God? That tripped me up. I didn't get it. They would try to explain the Trinity to, me, uh, Trinity to me. God is one essence, three persons. God is one who, three what's. And I really didn't get it until I actually started reading the Bible. Let me submit to you, if you're exploring spirituality, specifically Christian spirituality, reading the Bible is helpful. I'm just going to throw that out there. It's helpful. It's way better than watching Christian TV. It's way better than just going to some Christian bookstore and buying a book. It's way better than listening to guys like me. If you're exploring the claims of Jesus, read about Jesus. That is what convinced me that Jesus is who he said he was. Uh, verses like this in John chapter 10, verse 30, Jesus claims to be God. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And in this instance and another in the Gospel of John, we know that he claimed to be God because they took it that way and they tried to kill him and stone him because he blasphemed. Jesus not only claimed to be God, Jesus acted like God. He said to this paralytic before he healed him, my son, your sins are forgiven. Right? And, the, and the religious leader said, this guy's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus, who do you think you are, God? Jesus allowed people to worship him as God. Thomas, doubting Thomas, after, this is post-resurrection, Jesus allowed Thomas to explore his doubts, which is the great thing about Jesus. That's what he does for us. And so Thomas touched his side and, and felt his hands, and he fell down at his feet and said, my Lord and my God, Jesus claimed to be God. Jesus acted like God. Jesus let people worship him as God. This is why it is simply not enough just to make Jesus a nice guy or a good prophet or a great teacher. 
Listen to these, this powerful quote from one of my favorite authors. C.S. Lewis says this, A man who was merely a man and said and did the sort of things Jesus said and did would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg or would be the devil of hell. You must take your choice. Either this was and is the Son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up as a fool or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let, let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He simply has not left that open to us. Jesus is that which comes from the beginning, as we'll see in our text. He's the logos. He's the personal force behind all of creation and all of wisdom. Jesus was God, but he was also a man. John, in our text, talks about this idea of, I've heard him. I, I, I've seen him. I've, I've, I've literally touched him post-resurrection. What John is saying is this. Jesus was a human being. God who cannot be contained by time, this is Christmas, God who cannot be contained by time was born in a small, smelly manger meant for farm animals. God was born there. God was born there. He had flesh and blood. He had emotions. He sweated. He was fully human. He was what every human being should be. He was the prototype. He was the blueprint. He was perfectly obedient, which means he was totally surrendered. Now, this is, what, this is why a lot of us are kept from Christianity, because we think that spirituality is about commitment. So we think, okay, well, if I'm going to do this Christian thing, i got to work harder, i got to pray more, i got to really develop my willpower. This is not how Jesus lived. The key for Jesus was not his commitment, but his surrender. He said, I have come not to do my will, but, the one of him, but, but him of who sent me. He says, not my will, he prayed, but your will be done. Surrender is what guided his life. And lest you have some rose-colored glasses look at surrender and think, oh, it's so wonderful, surrender. Christianity is about surrender. Surrender is what got him killed. Surrender is what led him to the cross. Philippians 2.8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even death on a what, church? Even death on a... That's where surrender got Jesus. Jesus lived the life that we should have lived. He died a death that we should have died. The one who was sinless was treated as sinful. We just celebrated that at, at, on Good Friday. But let me, let me tell you this, because this is big for some of you. Some of you have been greatly sinned against. Did you know that the cross speaks to your situation? Because the cross was uh, absorbing things. The cross absorbed all of, your, all of your shame, all of your betrayal, all of your injustice, all of the racism you've experienced, all the abuse that has been given to you. His death was shame and injustice absorbing so that you don't have to absorb it, so that it doesn't have to be the defining characteristic of your life. This is what resurrection means. His death was sin and wrath absorbing because it's not just that people have sinned against us, we have sinned against God. We have lied. You guys know you lie, right? You did it this morning, probably. You probably have done it since you've been in here. We all lie. We all cheat, right? We all, we all have lust. We all have gr- It's a real deal. We sin. Here's the good news. The death of Jesus pays for our sin. And so we don't have to live under guilt and we don't have to live under condemnation because Jesus has absorbed the wrath of God for us. Now, we can talk about life. We can talk about death. And it is important. But... It's the resurrection that really jacked John the Apostle's life up. I mean, think about this guy. If you, if you don't understand resurrection, you don't get Christianity. That's why Easter is the Super Bowl of Christianity, right? It is the event. It is the reason. You say, well, I know, wait a minute. Christmas is bigger than Easter, Darren. Yes, culturally. Yes, commercially. But without Easter, Christmas failed. Easter is the culmination of God's rescue mission. Now this takes us back to John, because here is John walking with Jesus, ministering to Jesus, seeing crazy miracles, uh, seeing Jesus heal people, all kinds of awesome stuff, for three and a half years. Everybody says, oh, if I could just see a miracle, I would believe. No, you wouldn't. He didn't. Many of the, the disciples didn't. It took The resurrection. You want a raw miracle for God to do for you? 
It took the resurrection for John in John chapter 20, verse 8. Let's read this together. John chapter 20, verse 8. If you can see it, read it. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and this was John. He never called himself by his own name. He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was the other disciple. What got him was the resurrection. Christianity is mystical because it claims we have a relationship with a dead guy. But Christianity is also historical. And this is why in 1 John 1, uh, 1, 1, this wonderful, changed guy who started following Jesus as a teenager says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and touched with our hands concerning the logos of life, the word of life, The life was made manifest, resurrection. We've seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. John is saying this, I was at the cross. I watched him die. I witnessed the empty tomb. I held the grave clothes. I saw him alive. I touched him. See, friends, Christianity is mystical, but it's also historical because our faith is grounded in history. It exists outside of our experience. It's it's grounded in certain specific, irreversible, irreductible events in history. Jesus was born during the empirical reign of Caesar Augustus. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He did rise again. He did appear to 500 people on one occasion. There is an objectivity to our faith because of that event, but there is a present connectivity because of our faith because Jesus didn't just do something in history. He's alive right now. Continuing to read 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. Resurrection equals communion with God. Because Jesus rose again, you can have a relationship with this God. You, can't just, you, you can have more than just a, a great event in history that you believe. You can have a present relationship, a present fellowship, a present communion with God that, that ignites your head and your heart. Religion typically goes one way or another, does it not? Re- religion typically goes to our head, here's some great dogma, facts you must believe, or to our hearts, hey, just had this wonderful experience. Christianity touches both. It fills your head. It captivates your heart. It challenges your intellect, but it touches you on an emotional level. Our faith is rooted and grounded in a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago. But because of the resurrection, it isn't just the past. It's right now. We can experience God right now, which is why John in his gospel writes these incredible words. He says, this is eternal life, knowing the only true God. There is a true God. The resurrection proved it. One true God. But you can know him. You can actually know him. And many times, and I don't, I, I'm sure those of you who are followers of Jesus, you know this. You follow Jesus and you understand Jesus and the Bible starts making sense when you hang out with people that follow Jesus. This is what John is saying in 1 John 1, 3. He says, not just that we have fellowship with God the Father, we can have fellowship with us, with the church. Sometimes the resurrection only makes sense when you experience the aliveness of Jesus' followers. This is what happened to me. I didn't go to church, didn't grow up going to church, didn't know Bible verses, nothing. The first few Christians I met were weird. Has anybody ever had that experience? And, and raise your hand, I see that hand. Mass confession is great for the soul, right? Uh, I, I, every one of them. And finally, I meet these two guys, and I thought, I could be a Christian like that. It, Christianity starts really making sense. You go, I could do that like that guy, right? That makes sense. There were two guys, and both of these guys were normal. They were like me, but they weren't like me, right? They liked sports, they liked girls, they liked heavy metal, they had mullets. This has been a few years ago, right? They were were good guys, right? And they resembled Jesus. When I I was with them, I thought, this this must be what Jesus is like. These guys are gracious and and, and kind, and, and they're not afraid to tell each other the truth, and but when they tell you the truth, they don't use it to push you away. They, they, they use it to pull you near. I, I'd never seen anything like that. What this text is telling us is the fellowship we can experience because of the resurrection is not just with God, it's with each other. Christianity is love God and then love people, right? Love 
people, and we need people. We cannot pursue our spirituality alone. This is why the church is so important. You can meet people who are like you but not like you. You can meet people who can guide you and help you. It's very likely that you are here with someone who may have been sent by God to help you know him better. It is very likely that there are people in and around your life that God has put there so that you can know him better. Here's the question. Are you listening? Are you spending enough time with them so that you can actually hear God through them? Because Christianity is communal. It's mystical. It's historical. It's communal. See, there are many ways people miss God. They focus on the rational and they never experience God in their emotions. It's all cognitive. It's all head, no heart. Or they focus on the personal. It's our heart, it's our heart and no head. And they never really think through their faith. Or they focus on the in- individual and they never experience God through others. But here's my guess for many of us in this room. We may miss God in those ways. My guess is many of us in this room, and this is my sin, and this is my challenge. I miss God all the time because I focus on the law of Christianity, the rules of Christianity, so to speak, and I miss the heart. And the heart of Christianity is joy. 1 John 1, 4. We are writing these things so that our, what's the J word? Joy may be made complete. Joy in Christianity would have been, I would have never put those words together until I started reading the Bible. To be a Christian, in my mind, and I'm guessing in your mind, Matt, uh, you got to deny your own personal happiness so you can make God happy. After all, if you seek your own happiness, that's selfish, right? That's not what Christianity is about. Christians are supposed to seek God, not their own pleasure. Well, listen to a man who... um, was fairly smart. Blaise Pascal, may have heard of him. His findings led to what is now known as the scientific method. He was the brilliant 16th century mathematician, philosopher, theologian. Listen to his words. All men, he writes, seek happiness. This is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end, happiness. The cause of of some going to war and others avoiding it is the same desire in both, attending with different views. They will, never take, they will never take the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every person, even those who hang themselves. Pascal is pointing this reality out. Every one of us is pursuing happiness. Most of the things we do are to make us happy, even if we cloak it in various selfless ways. It is about us. And what I began to realize, reading verses like this and others, my desire for happiness and joy is not at odds with my desire to know God. Pursuing God and joy are one and the same. This is radical. This is what my heart has a hard time believing. I really believe if I'm going to follow God, I'm going to be miserable. He's going to ask me to do terrible things that I hate all the time. I have to fight that. Yes, God asked us to suffer and sacrifice for sure. I mean, the logo of Christianity is a cross, okay? I mean, it, it, there's suffering there. But Jesus went to that cross, the writer of Hebrews tells us, for the joy set before him. Joy and God are not at odds. So how do you enter this? Oh, well, you're going to tell me now to work up my emotions so I actually like the songs we just sang to, to, to chuck my intellect, right, to give in to the hype. No. No, it's much more radical than that. I'm going to ask you to do one of the key words throughout John's writings. One key word is love, because that's the essence of Christianity. But the other key word he employs is the word believe. The word believe. And there's a specific grammatical construction that he uses when he talks about believing in Jesus. He uses the word that doesn't mean in Jesus. He uses the word that means into Jesus. Believe into Jesus. Now, believe, I, I get the facts. That, I, I mentally assent to the facts. Believe into has this idea of trust, dependence, right? Surrender. The best illustration I know of this point happened in the 19th century. There was this guy, he was a daredevil guy. He would gather crowds and do crazy stuff and get their money, right? And um, so he decided to come to America. He was a Frenchman, and his name was Blondin, and he called himself the Great Blondin. And he, and he went to Niagara Falls. Anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? Ever, ever seen it? Everybody still awake? 
All right, we're almost done. Hang in there. Blondin goes to Niagara Falls, and he says, I've got to do something that tops everything. And so he stretches a tightrope across it, 110 feet, 60 feet. I'm sorry, 110 feet across. I'm messing the stats up. 1,100 feet across, 110 feet above the water. Stretches it across. He starts going across that rope. And people are like, oh, my gosh. Right? But, but when you're an entertainer, you've got to give them more, right? So then, so it wasn't enough for him to walk. He wasn't getting people's money. He wasn't getting the crowds. So he says, I will go across in a sack. Pulled a sack up, kind of hopped across, right? That got old. I will go across pushing a wheelbarrow with weights in the wheelbarrow. That was cool for a while. I will go across on stilts. He survived all these things, by the way. Then one day, it was like, the stilts weren't enough. The wheelbarrow wasn't enough. He's got to do something big. He's got to do something awesome. He's got to get the buzz going so more people will come to, so that he can earn a living by being crazy, right? So, so he says, all right, people, I've gone across in stilts. I've gone across in a wheelbarrow. I put a sack on. Who believes that I can carry any person or in this crowd across this tightrope on my back? Who believes this? And everybody's like, yes, we believe it. And he said, who will get on my back? <laughs> and only his manager, and there's actually a picture of this, would get on his back. Many believed in Jean-Francois Blondin. Only his manager believed into him. See the difference? Now, some of you are thinking, oh my gosh, I've got, okay, so I've got to have a lot of faith, is what you're telling me, Darren. I've got to have some really strong, powerful faith. No. It's not about the strength of your faith. It's about the strength of the object of your faith. And the object of our faith is Jesus. And believe me, he is strong. And believe me, he takes weak people. God is not looking for self-willed heroes. He is looking for self-surrendered servants. Easter is not about bunnies and family and, and, and eggs. All those things are awesome, especially the family piece. Easter is not about turning over a new leaf or, or, or getting new opportunities. Easter is about an encounter with the living God. Every other founder of every other, uh, other religion, check it out, check it out, says this. Here is the way to look for and find God. Jesus says, I am God, and I'm looking for you. I'm looking for you, but you have to believe into me. So let me give you some questions for reflection. Is Jesus real to you? I mean really real. I don't mean like historically real, real. Do you trust Jesus more than you trust yourself? A lot of church people say they believe in Jesus, but really they believe in themselves. He's not their savior, they are. He's not the king, they are. Do you do anything that's terrifying unless Jesus is real? I mean, do you get on the tightrope ever? I mean, do you do things that your friends and your family go, you're insane, and you're like, yes, I am, unless a dead guy got out of the tomb. That's insane. That's insane. Do you do anything that's impossible in your own strength unless Jesus is really alive? See, this message hits us whether we're checking Jesus out, skeptical of Jesus, or we claim to be a follower of Jesus. Resurrection says God is real and present, and he's after you. He came alive not just to prove the point. He came alive to enter a relationship with his people. He wants to know you deeply. He wants to know you. He loves you. Well, I lived a terrible life. I got good news. Jesus lived a perfect life. Well, I, I deserve punishment for my sin. I've got good news. Jesus was punished in your place for your sin. Well, I'm just, I, I just don't know how I can do this. I mean, I'm just not that. My faith is not that strong. I'm pretty weak. Good. Jesus rose from the dead, and his power in and through you will help you do what God wants you to do. So my, my strong challenge for you is to think on and believe into this God who was raised from death for you. This God who enables you 
to tap into the wisdom of the universe and a peace that passes every understanding known to mankind. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that death is not the end of the story, that pain is not the end of the story, that suffering is not the end of the story, that confusion is not the end of the story. I thank you that we can know you, and the resurrection proves that. May what we have done today not be in vain, O oh God. You brought us here in this, in this wonderful arena, not just to sing songs or to be with family or to punch the clock. You brought us here because you know us. You know what's in our hearts. You know our thoughts. You know our attitudes. And you love us anyway. So God, help us to believe into Jesus. And we trust you to make that so. In Jesus' name, amen.